I'm ready whenever you are. Oh, <laughs> here we go. Welcome back, everyone. Hello, uh, it's Christina again, and I have the lovely Michelle Clementine with us here today. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Um, because I don't know the full story, I would love it if you would speak about how you got into this business, how you started with cameras or just film in general. Oh, yeah. Um, well, with film in general, um, my dad used to like just be a photographer as his hobby, you know, um, and I, I had a cousin who used to just, before Instagram, she was just a great selfie taker you know like she just always took great photos and so i was always fascinated by her and like my high school had a photography class a darkroom photography class and so i took that class and i like basically my cousin was my muse from there and i started taking photos of her and really the rest of my family and kind of telling like a sort of uh second generation immigrant story in that sense you know um and I kind of just left it alone I just thought it was like a hobby not that you could actually you know make a living being a photographer and I think even in at that age in high school I was like I'm, I'm a woman I'm brown they're not gonna I'm not gonna make any kind of money I'm not gonna be a broke artist and all that so forget that talk that my teachers were pushing me to be a photographer yeah. And I just left it alone. I was like, they're crazy. And so over the next couple of years, and, you know, I took a year off after high school, and then I went to college. And through those years, I was just taking all different types of internships at all different places. And I was going to be an art curator at a museum. Cool. And, you know, put on a summer show at a museum. Um, cause I just always just loved art, but there was something about it that just didn't feel right. You know, I didn't feel like it was completely me, you know? And after that internship, I had one with the Tribeca Film Festival and I really loved film. And I said, well, I was reading scripts all day. It was fun. I just, I just loved that whole world. So I just started, you know, pick production major at my college. Thought I was crazy. <laughs> I had no idea. I was like, even I knew at that time, like, it's all about who you know, and I, I didn't know anybody. And yeah. so, but I just did it anyways and harassed camera guys because I just loved the lenses. I just gravitated towards the camera every time I came on set as a PA. And it was just from there, you know? I worked at Aerie as a prep tech and, you know, working at CSC for about a year and a half or so. Um, before I joined Local 600. I took the Ooh. test in 2010 and it's been a good, uh, it's been a good ride. <laughs> a, a decade. <laughs> years total, but 10 years in the union. So it's been, it's been good. It's been good. That's awesome. Uh, were, would you say that there were certain people or like events that really like shaped your career, especially in the past 10 years? Oh man. Yeah, yeah, there were a lot of, um, there were notable people. I think I never really got in with a crew, you know? I kind of, I had a lot of great connections, but I hopped around a lot. I never really had a home, really until um, around 2014, you know? Um, Spike Lee and 40 Acres, like, family um, kind of took me in and, you know, working with uh, Daniel Patterson and uh, Christine, Christine Ang and Ter Ter Terrence Burke. Um, I, uh, I really like met a whole other world of camera people that I had never been exposed to. I didn't see, I never saw so many black people on set, so many, um, you know, Puerto Ricans and all like a mix of people on set. Um, and it was nice, you know, it was nice to just be around that. And then from there, you know, I worked a lot in the non-union world with um, uh, Kareem Johnson. And his father is like a legendary gaffer out of Atlanta. So it's just like, you know, his uncle was um, Hardwick Johnson, the VP of CSC on the electric oh. side. 
So it was just like to see that it was like this whole network of people yeah. um, and working with Kareem and all his people, like doing all the music videos and shorts and stuff like that, commercials. It was just like this whole other world that allowed me to like expand um, a little bit more professionally. Like I had more opportunities that, you know, if I would have stayed with just the union guys um, on those TV shows or movies or something, I would have been a loader for a lot longer than I was. Mm. An a, a second AC for a lot longer than I was, you know? I was yeah. able to acquire the skills that I think would have been a little bit harder or longer to, to get because I didn't have a specific crew nurturing those things, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, those guys were wonderful to me, <laughs> you know? I was wondering if you could, again, little things I don't know about Michelle. Uh, where were you in the world when COVID hit? Like, were you on a job? Were you preparing for a job? I was, actually. I was, um, there was this, what is it? This, um, this horror movie or something um, that I was working on in upstate New York. I was like a camera operator that came in and um, I was just supposed to be there for a couple of weeks and then, you know, basically be with them like as a day player operator coming in. Okay. And I had, I think just been on it for about a week, a week and a half and that was when people were talking about like, what's this whole COVID thing? This was like around yeah. um, like March or like end of February or something. Yeah. And, and yeah, and <laughs> it's just, everybody was like giving elbows instead of <laughs> hugs and, and handshakes and stuff. And the next week, everything was shut down, like as yeah. far as productions went. And then I think it took another couple of weeks for New York to do the official shutdown too so yeah they pulled the plug on the job and I got out of Dodge <laughs> I was like I'm not gonna be in New York City when a freaking pandemic so um I've come to LA and and just kind of been uh hanging out here and waiting it out you know yeah well that's something that I've been it's been really empowering as I've been doing the series asking everyone along the way how they've managed to keep their morale up or keep their inspiration up. Because uh, from anyone that's in this industry or not, you know, some people get really in the grind in their work and their career, you know, or just like work, 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 work. What's the next job? What's the next job? Especially as freelancers. Right, right. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how you've, you've done that for yourself in the past versus how you're doing that now. Well, when I first joined in 2010, um, I actually moved to New Orleans um, and I was central. I joined as a central region member with New York as my production city. Oh, okay. So I lived in New Orleans for a few years um, as my primary residency. And, you know, I'm from the Bronx. I'm a born and raised, you know, New Yorker. And it's very common for us to feel as natives that we live in the greatest city in the world, you know? Um, and that's fine, you know, that's great. But you also realize that there's just a whole other way to live. And when I went to New Orleans, um, I just felt really in tuned with like mm -hmm. deeper things, like with my spirit and like where I want my life to go and to be. And I really wasn't caught up with the grind of things. Like I was able to take myself, even though I worked down there too, but I was able to take myself out because the culture in New Orleans is basically, I'm gonna make enough money to pay my rent and my bills and everything is to party and drink, you know? So they really have a very um, fun approach to life where work and being away from your family is not really accepted, you know? Like work is not an excuse to miss moments with your people, you know? and that was a nice um, perspective to take in, you know? And I was, so basically throughout my career, I've maintained that oh. um, philosophy of like, anytime I feel like 
it's too much. I'm overworked, overburdened. I don't take certain jobs of a certain length of time. You know, I don't want to do an eight or 10 month TV show, you know, like, that's great. I know that the money is amazing. I've, I've experienced this in the past. I, it's, it, th that doesn't matter to me, you know, yes. like what matters to me is to be able to enjoy my life, you know, with my family. Um, and so I really appreciate um, that gift that living in New Orleans gave to me that I've been able to take. And even though I'm not a central region member anymore, you know, I'm still East, I'm fully Eastern region now. Um, but I've been able to take that kind of approach. And, you know, that was kind of how LA came into the picture where it was just like, you know, I had a, an opportunity at AFI for a cinematography course and took that and it opened up LA in another way that I, I didn't imagine for myself at all. So it's, it's been really wonderful. How long has it been since you took that AFI course? Um, that was in 2018. It was like a pilot program, uh, cinematography intensive for women. Yeah. And it was, it's, I think it's like something that they're creating to mirror the director's women's workshop that okay. they have that, you know, it's, it's, a, I think a free program and it's, I think a year. I don't really know the details oh, okay. of it. But um, they want it to be similar to that, but with cinematography, because Rachel Morrison is um, a graduate of that school, and yeah. she's the first woman to be nominated for an Academy Award for cinematography. So um, AFI was like taking the lead in trying to get more women to want to follow this path as well. Yeah. And through this program, they want this to be the catalyst for that. And so, so yeah, the first, the first um, pilot program, I guess, that they did for that, um, I was part of that group. And it was just a wonderful group of ladies from all over the country, most of them based here. And- um, Based in New York City? Based in or LA. Based in LA, okay. Yeah, yeah. And um, there were some in New York City, but it was just a really, I think the biggest thing I got out of it, because you meet all of these wonderful like yeah. VPs and ASC members and all these people giving like master classes to their process and, and you know, just all this stuff. And the biggest thing that I got out of it was that I could shoot, you know? And it was just, I had, I didn't realize that I, I didn't have that confidence in myself and mm. thinking that the more that I know, the, the then I'll be ready. But there's just so much to know. You can't know everything. Yeah. And the biggest gift that that experience gave me was none of us know what we're doing. <laughs> we're all just figuring it out. Yeah. You just, you, you know, you just shoot because you love it, you know, and um, you don't have to know everything. And I think knowing, realizing that was the biggest piece of my puzzle mm -hmm. and kind of let me let go of, you know, I'll, I'm a first AC, I gotta only do this, or I'm an operator, I gotta only do this. Yeah. You know, if I'm calling myself a DP, that means I can't do these things. And we really get stuck in yeah. the seniority and, and all that stuff. And it's just like, we forget that this is an artistic field, really at the core of it. Um, so why am I not allowing myself to explore that? And, you know, I, I started in the arts, you know, with, with curating, you know, and so I've always had an appreciation for art and I didn't, I never really saw photography or cinematography as art for a long time because I just saw paintings as that when you get into it it's just like no this is a medium that communicates different things that can affect people in different ways and it adds to the culture you know and so i mean i like me so why why don't i give my perspective on how i see the world or, or contribute in my own small way yeah. even if it's for short films or for you know a music video or whatever like yeah and right now that's all I'm really doing, but um, 
you know, it's, it's been, it's been interesting growing in, in that self-confidence, you know, um, and realizing that there's nothing stopping me from doing what I want to do in that sense. Yeah. Oh, that was just so empowering. I'm like, go out, <laughs> like, want to go out and shoot right now. <laughs> that was what AFI gave me. It made me realize, I like, mean it. Yeah. You, realize, you, you start thinking that, oh, yeah. I'm a woman and, you know, they're saying no to me because of that. And, oh, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm black, I'm Latina, I'm Asian, I'm whoever. And like these people have a problem. It's just like, and then you see these guys and how they act and they're doing that to everybody. Yeah. You know, but we internalize it through our own personal filters. Yeah. And that thing, that, that time at AFI was just a weekend, you know, like it wasn't even an entire week. It was like oh. a four or five day weekend. And um, everybody from like the proto the prototypical white man coming in to the women coming in all saying, I had no idea what I was doing. I just yeah. liked the camera, you know? I was scared. Like, I, like all of them talking about, you know, feeling like a fraud. Like they're not, <laughs> they're, they're not, you know, they didn't have the confidence and they just yeah. were willing to make the mistakes and figure it all out, you know? And, and I realized I was do, had these self-imposed kind of, mental uh blocks that were like prohibiting me from moving forward in this way or even seeing myself as an operator a first ac a dp yeah. you know um, i was afraid to tell people i was a dp if i was still telling if i was still taking jobs as a focus puller you know and then it was just like for well, what yeah. you know like i like all of it and i'm, I'm embracing that yeah. way more now than i used to in the past you know it's like almost conditioned to us, right? Is this yeah. like the thing? I'm only No, it I is. think, yeah, I mean, honestly, with all the, this is now my 17th interview that I've done. Right. And I think everyone has said the same thing. Like really, like whether they're under 30 or over 70, like there's all those moments of like, how do you get started? Like, is everyone going to think I'm a fraud for doing this? Like, can I not do other things because I've now been this label? Like all the, it's really all of that. It's, if anything, I just, I find it such this, this community of support. And when you have those people that root for you, it's just, it gets you to that next level, you know? And it's yeah. either that, maybe that one mentor or that one program or that one job or something, but there's like that clicking point where like a lot of people have said that too. And it's empowering to me. I mean, I've only done this for under five years. Yeah. You know, or at least worked with cameras officially. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, no, that's great for you. I'm I'm happy because it's like you're reaching that. And I think that's because of also the power of technology where people are yeah. able to share these um these thoughts, you know. Um and a lot of times you everybody you realize that everybody feels some level of like, you know, yeah, they have confidence, but there is a level of insecurity too. Yeah. And sometimes even the, even the guys that we admire the most are just like, yeah, I had an idea about what I wanted, but I wasn't sure how any of it would come out. So I just yeah. did it anyway. It's just like, I'm all caught up thinking I've got to have all the diagrams that yeah. nailed down and you yeah. know, everything. And it's just like, and really that's, that's where the sauce is, hmm. you know, that, that you can control as much as you can control. But at some point, the part that you can't control, the part that you can't plan, and it still shows itself, that's the magic. That's the sauce mm -hmm. of what we do, you know? And it's always those moments that we're trying to at least have that camera recording and, and catching in that sense. Do you find there are certain people that if you have in your corner, you feel that much stronger doing it? Like if you're shooting and you know that you've got that operator or that gaffer, you're like, oh, we're going to get this. Absolutely. Like you build a synergy with people, you know? Um, and, and me, I'm, I'm personally the kind of person that once I'm with you and we find our groove, like I'm rocking with you, like yeah. finish line, you know? Um, I know a lot of great people and I've seen how everyone works. Um, and 
to me, it's not so much how well you perform your job, even though that is definitely part of it. It's more so um, the emotional support, you know, like I feel there's some, you know, you know who you gravitate to, what types of personalities you gel with the most. And um, it's not just about you doing an excellent job at your thing, because I'm, I'm at a point in my career where I'm willing to, to rock with people who maybe don't have certain opportunities who want that opportunity and I could sort of train them into like, this is what I'm going for, you know, yeah. um, in, in terms of like my ACs or camera crew and stuff. And it's nice building that, you know, so I have a lot of people who I've worked with over the years, people who I've trained um, and who are doing well for themselves and they've taken off, you know, and anytime I'm like, Hey, I need you for something like they show up and it's just their presence makes me happy. It was just yeah. who you are as a person is what I gravitate towards the most. Um, because if I have two great people who like mm -hmm. two people who are great at their job, who am I rocking with? The one with the bad attitude or the one who <laughs> makes me smile? Even if the one with the bad attitude might be a little bit, just a little bit better than this guy, but you're in the same range. I'm, I don't care. Yeah. I, like I, I'd rather that's the bet I'll make in that situation. Are there uh, certain individuals that you've had, would you say like the longest collaborations with, or are there just people in your history that i just kind of, you always go back to. Um, I've worked a lot with um, my second AC, Andrew Mojica. He's in the non-union world. He does a lot of reality stuff, but I get him on with me for music videos or commercials and, and, and or documentaries. And he's just amazing. I can't say yeah. enough about him. He's just, he makes everybody smile. He makes everybody happy, but he's so great at his job. And he's a little goofy, but you know, like he's awesome. Like he literally like brings joy to everybody on set when he comes in and it's like it's those kinds of people you know Skyla Page who she's somebody out of uh Chicago um who else uh <laughs> there's a lot of people though. yeah there's a lot of people you know I love Smitty you know he's a grip out of New York um who else uh it's, it's a lot of it's a lot of people <laughs> okay it's it's really because I've been doing this for so long you know yeah. I know so Rudy Cardi like so many people that I've met over the years who I absolutely adore, you know, Pierce Robinson, um, uh, Jan Burgess, you know, uh, so many people, Diana, Diana Matos, like, I love her. Like, so there's a bunch of people who yeah. I've met throughout my career who I absolutely like just adore them and want to always work with them. And, I think those people are, are probably like, they're definitely the go-tos in a lot of situations. Yeah. Are there, um, are there certain cinematographers that you go to too, that you're like, I love their work. I could always watch it. Oh man. Yeah. I love a lot of, uh, Robert Richardson. Yeah. Uh, you know, just a lot of the stuff he does is just so funky, you know. Um, I love his work. I love, um, God, why am I like blanking out? You know, I had all of these names, like, I was like, who do I really like, you know? Um, but I've been watching, I've actually been watching a lot of uh, Tarantino lately. Oh, yeah? Just, yeah, studying Bob Richardson. So I've been like, he's been on my head heavy, but I've been doing, I've actually been researching just so many people. And um, there's just a lot of really great work out there. Uh, that's the only one I can think of right now. I'm so sorry. I'm like completely. <laughs> no, it's okay. Well, oh, curious. Tommy Maddox. I love his work. Oh, I'm not sure. Um, he does like Snowfall and, and oh. I, I love to work on Snowfall. Um, I love uh, Kira Kelly. She did some really like wonderful work on Insecure this year and, and uh, Michelle uh, Lawler, I think. Um, 
She's yeah. done really wonderful work along yeah. with them on that show and this other one called Twenties. Okay. So there's like there's like a bunch of there's really a bunch of people who I really appreciate their work. And John Simmons, like I've I've met him this year and he he's just awesome and badass, man. He's been yeah. taking photos since the sixties. And so seeing his work and how it evolved into cinematography, um I I like appreciate all of these people and their work. Uh, when you look at other cinematographers and maybe I mean, when you look at someone who has like this really long career, maybe you can see it more, but like, do you see their aesthetics? And then you can say to yourself like, oh, I know what my aesthetic is. Like my aesthetic is like that or mine isn't. Like, do you feel that with yourself or your work? I think, yeah. Um, the thing I keep thinking about with my interpretation of things lately has been more so in, I've been caught up in texture. Really? You know, I've been really caught up in texture and not just like lighting texture, but the actual like physical texture of mm -hmm. the film, you know, like, is this something that's going to be real slick and we shoot with like a master prime on, you know, some 12K like camera, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, or are we going to do something with a lot of grain and like, hey, why don't we pull out a Super 8 or something, you know? Um, I really love texture. I really love finding um, a way to contribute to the story by looking at the physical texture or creating a physical texture to the image. And so I've been so obsessed with it. I like, um, I got a 16 millimeter camera. Oh, yeah? Just to, yeah, like, I'm like so excited to shoot with this thing. And I have a project at the end of the month that I'm gonna shoot. So I'm like thinking about incorporating it as like even as a B camera to mm -hmm. what I'm shooting so that, you know, just to see ways to weave in something that feels um, different, you know, and just what the emotional responses to those things mm -hmm. are, you know, people respond to things like, it's like the difference between looking at a phone, like a camera phone, like photo yeah. to, a Polaroid in your hand, you know, like the way you, you respond to those things emotionally are very different. And so considering those things is like kind of what I've been studying um, in my lens tests and film tests the last like few weeks, just trying to nail down what my mm. look is in that sense. Oh, those are just really uh, exciting for me too. Cause I feel like that when I like specifically during quarantine, when I've watched like so much content in general whether it's films or tv um those like kind of like subversive moments where like did the frame rate just change did like am hey, i like yeah. did i just see that differently like those are really exciting to me because sometimes you can really kind of like go like back into your head and like yeah. I don't know, it's like you're processing so you much know, information you're not I'm as critical like living like a slug on my sofa watching these things yeah the last couple of months, it's like, you know what? I think I know what I like, you know? And I kind of <laughs> figure that out. So it, it has yeah. contributed to something. It, it, it actually meant something. I wasn't actually just being a slug on my sofa. Yeah, I know. I mean, that's that hit me a lot too. I realized like there's certain movies you watch are like, oh, these are the classics. Like everyone says you have to watch these ones, you know? Right. And it really hit me I'm like, well, that's a very specific type of story they're telling. There's only very specific type of people that are a part of those teams that are telling that story, you know? Right, right. And it really made me go like, like what other stories have I not listened to? Like, why am I always watching uh, Tarantino or Scorsese or Cronenberg or I don't know. Like, there's just like, why am I always listening to those kind of guys? Like, why haven't I gone out of my way to watch Kira Kelly's work or see I don't know, Natasha Breyer's work? Like, Oh, I love Natasha. She's just so awesome. I love yeah. Neon King. And she, she actually came to the AFI thing and spoke to us as Oh, well. did she? Oh, that's yeah. awesome. And, and so it's, yeah, and I, I agree with that, you know, like trying to expand and discover other things. And, you know, I've actually like, in the last month or so, I've like been getting into like anime and oh, like cool. Asian and European like filmmaking, you know, um, and now like more African like projects, you know, like Queen Sano and 
just all of these other things that um, just trying to expand um, even the way I've been taught to think about filmmaking, you know? Yeah. Um, what are other like camera angles or movements that I'm not thinking about? And that's what I kind of like about the anime stuff because it's mm. showing me like different types of angles that because the world is boundless, you know, but they still yeah. live in, in, in rules, you know? So it's been interesting to see that and how they stick to those rules or how they bend them. Um, and trying to make my thoughts like more outside of that. And so that's why it's like, you know, COVID kind of messed it up, but I had like, you know, connections in the UK and like, you know, they don't have a union system like we do. Like, um, so I want to see even how they do filmmaking out there and like yeah. how the approach, like what, the work environment is on set, you know? So I've been, you know, I've, I've been going out there a little bit more, not so much this year, but just over the course of the past year, um, opening up my options out there and, and, and making my connections out there just to see uh, how they shoot and how that can inform and like what I already know and ways I can apply that if, if need be. Yeah, it is really curious to see how people's storytelling abilities or even just their experience of like community building on set can be so narrowed by their city. Like, well, this is how New York does it. Yes. This is how LA does yes. it. This is how Atlanta does it. You know, like it to me, it's like, I've only done this for five years, but people like have told me their camps. Like we are like team this, team that, you know? And oh my God, yes, I know. I know. It is like New York is very hard ass with, the union thing it's a union yeah. town it's a union city so of yeah. course um but you know uh in new orleans it's a little bit more laid back you know uh cali i've only just started working like my first jobs in la non-union stuff like recently and i don't really do too much but yeah helping out my friends or shooting my own stuff and the crews here have been just just really cool so far yeah. you know like i've really enjoyed everyone that i've met and worked with um but you do see more like the attitude is more relaxed out here they still yeah. very much believe in the union but it's just not like it, it's they're more groovy you know like they go yeah. with the flow a little bit more <laughs> like hey man like all right it's it's really the only thing in that sense yeah uh, but yeah, 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 New York is funny. <laughs> I just, it makes me think of it too, because when you're not conscious of the content you're consuming and the content you also participate in making, right. it's really easy how limited you can feel. And we are more of an international world, an international guild. Like you would think that there's more of an outreach there if you look for it or if you educate yourself and find out about it you know or put yourself there like obviously before covid you could be a bit more um just able to travel right so like you know i'm gonna go to england or i'm gonna go here right, right? so it's clearly a new terrain <laughs> now but yeah they call it an international union but i think maybe when they formed this you know thing it's like it was in an era where you know the World Series, you know, and International <laughs> Camera Union, but they really just mean America. That's yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. No other country is involved in any of these things for real. So it's yeah. interesting in that sense, but you're allowed to work in your jobs internationally. So I guess it's kind of like those types of protections or agreements that are in yeah. place, you know. It's it, is a, it is a funny little thing that like it's kind of stayed, I guess. Mm -hmm. But um, again, speaking of the world that we live in, <laughs> I'm curious, I mean, you've already kind of gone back to some projects, but in that period between being quarantined to what is set going to look like, or what do you think projects are going to look like going forward? What are your thoughts on all that? Like, how has it felt to be back? Well, I've been asked to be part of a few things and I've declined a few things. So the only ones that I've worked on um, were literally like my own projects or projects from friends that, you know, I know really well. Yeah. Um, 
and supporting them in their work. I don't want to risk it. <laughs> like, I don't think it's worth it. I don't know what is going on. We have a lot of mixed messages from our government and there's so much infighting and I don't care about all that, but I just, yeah, I just rather play it safe and not risk anything. So I don't, I, I don't intend to do a big union set because I just don't, I don't know what it's, I don't know what it's going to look like. You know, I've been on very small projects, com a commercial and a music video. Um, and that's about as, that's about as big as I wanted to get, you know, like yeah. something easy, something short. Like, I don't know how, the, how a television show or a movie is going to happen with all this stuff yeah. and ensure safety. Um, and at the end of the day, it doesn't even matter how I feel about it because if the actors don't feel safe, yeah. we can't do anything. So <laughs> yeah, really up to them and how, how it goes with that. So how's it going to look going forward? Smaller crews. Uh, you know, I think for operators, there's going to be more um, like crane work you know, or not crane, it could be crane work, but also with the, with the motor heads now yeah. so that you're not physically in the room, you know, but yeah. you're operating from a separate room. Like those are the kinds of things I can think of, but I don't think people, people really underestimate how fast germs spread. And there's a lot of funky people on set. I've seen some gross things from you no know, couple couple funky grips or those background <laughs> actors they're all fishy so what does that look like <laughs> in our world going forward yeah no i don't i don't know i don't know it would it would depend on the project you know yeah it was funny one of my uh co-workers on the job i was on before uh this happened in march was, we were just talking about that the other day and like well you have almost have this assumption that only healthy people come to set you know, but then it's like, yeah, sure. All the healthy people are on set, but like, how often have you been on set and someone was like, just coughing all over the place and then putting their hands right into crafty or yeah, like just have I mean, no sense of before. like personal space. Well, there was no sense of personal space before. And you think people are going to like, Oh, six feet. And now everyone knows what six feet is. Like that'll, <laughs> that'll be fun. <laughs> People invade their space all the time too. I'm not trying to, I'm not going to take the risk. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. So I don't know what it's going to look like. I myself was not planning to even accept any jobs until after October, but now with the way things have just been so messy all summer, um, I know people who are getting calls from their TV shows hearing that they're not getting back till January. So yeah. who knows how long this is actually going to be, unless there's like a vaccine and numbers are going down like significantly. I don't want to risk it because it affects different people very differently. Like my dad yeah. and my brother had it and. Oh, really? Yeah. And my dad, like he sound like he sounded horrible, you know, we were actually really scared, but you know, he even developed pneumonia from it and like wow. it got really bad, but he never actually needed to go to the hospital. So it's just like, okay, he got better. Like they gave him pneumonia medication. So it's just like, I didn't even know they had pneumonia medication. You could just take home and walk Me away. Nice. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of things like, but my brother who had it probably back in like December, you know, it affect, it didn't affect him as badly as it did like my dad. You know, um, oh, we didn't have COVID at that time, yeah. but had all of those symptoms and he still has respiratory issues, like hard, mm -hmm. hard breathing. He's never had breathing issues before. Wow. So I don't want to risk those things, you know, because some bonehead doesn't know how to wash his hands, you know, or starts breathing all like, <laughs> I know that's the thing that gets me too, is that like, I don't. I don't understand how people can't logically understand empathy. Like I understand it's a physical thing and some people just maybe yeah. emotionally or spiritually are just more tapped into that. But I just, it's like, you've had, you, you've had someone in your life 
that's experienced breast cancer. So you understand the effects of what breast cancer could do to someone, right? Right. But like somehow it's like if you don't have anyone in your life that's had COVID, whether it's life threatening or just like a little cough, it's like but COVID yeah. doesn't exist. You're just idiots. Like, ugh. Anyways, I don't, <laughs> as much as I could go down that road. I just want to thank you so much for your time, Michelle. I know we could keep talking, but maybe people are like faded off at this point. Right. No, <laughs> this is fun though. Thank you so much for having me. Like, yeah. this, was, this was nice getting to know you and meeting you through this whole thing. And uh, thank you for having me. I know yeah. people who I really, um, who I know them and enjoyed what they had to say. So this, yeah. is, this is a lot of fun. I'm very, very honored to include you in all this. I'm, it's just really, it's exciting to not only interview people I know, but interview people I don't know. So that's been really fun. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.